Hello, friends. Welcome to God Talks with Reverend Goodwin. Tonight, our special guest is Doug Spearman. Um, Doug Spearman is a world-renowned actor, as well as a number of other talents that uh, this amazing Black man is going to bring to us tonight. I had an opportunity to encounter Doug when he was um, functioning as the character Chance on Noah's Ark. Um, and as a young African-American man who was still discerning my own identity and figuring out things in the world, um, him and the group of characters on Noah's Ark provided sort of a template of being, a modeling of something that did not exist for me at that time and still doesn't exist for a lot of, um, I would say, LGBT, a lot of people in the LGBT community even today. So I want you all to join me in giving a God Talks welcome to Doug Spearman. Hi, Doug. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Um, good, thank you so much for making the space and time to be a part of God Talks. And we're gonna jump right in to our time together. And my first question is going to be, Doug, tell us a little bit about yourself. I gave sort of this big picture um, description of you, but I'm curious as to if you would just give us a little intro to yourself. Well, you know, um, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C. Um, and we moved to Maryland, we moved to a place called Hyattsville, Maryland, which is right over the district line when I was about six, right before my seventh birthday. And a lot of how I see myself is the, the, the kid in the corner bedroom, you know, looking out the window at this forest that was about half a mile from my house. And on the other side of that forest was the entire world. And I just, all I wanted to do was get on the other side of that forest. You know what I mean? And I still think of myself and all the things that I've accomplished from the perspective of that, like, 13-year-old kid just trying to figure it out and wanting to be on the other side of that forest. And I, I've done that. I've, I've been lucky enough to live, you know, all over the world um, and all over the United States. I'm an actor. My parents didn't want me to be an actor, and so I kind of tricked them. I got a degree, I got a, a double major in theater performance and direction, but television production and direction, which mm. led me to, uh, which, you know, like I came out of college with jobs in TV and my, one of my, no, my actual, my first job was at BET. My first two jobs out of college were at BET. I was a associate producer on a cooking show that my aunt Ruth had called In the Kitchen with Ruth. And then I became um, associate sports producer at BET for two years, wow. and then I went to then I went into advertising at ABC in Washington, and then moved to Boston, and then finally LA. And and I had stopped acting for about seven years. And uh, when I was in Boston, I started acting again in commercials. And then I moved to LA, and it was commercials, TV, whatever, everything. But. Uh, you know, it gave me a really well-rounded career in order to like understand what goes on in front of the camera and behind the camera. And I was most of my life I've spent I've spent actually probably more time directing and writing than I actually have acting. Although I've been I've been in SAG since '94, but I've been an actor full time as a career. Well, not full time, sort of is part time since 1990. And a lot of people think, you know, like Noah's Ark was my, it was definitely my big break. I mean, I had some things like every other actor where I thought it was going to pop and it was going to be the thing. But it's really interesting that the thing that, that kind of made me famous was playing a gay black man. Do you know what I mean? And um, that was really interesting. And then, you know, I, I've written and directed two feature films. I'm on my third both of them, both two films actually star one of my Noah's Ark co-stars, Daryl Stevens. And, um, you know, um, I, I'm 58, I'll be 59 in September, and a couple of years ago I decided that I'd had enough of L.A. and I just wanted to be happy. So, I, you know, I've always wanted to build a career where happiness was the number one reason for me to do anything. And so I, I was happy in New Orleans and I moved here. And here yeah. <laughs> okay, Nolans, I support that. <laughs> I support that. Um, Doug, you said something that I want to I want to talk about a phrase that we hear often, and I want to know how it applies to you. Sometimes people say, you know, I can't see the forest because of the trees. And I'm curious for you as this person who was like, well, actually on the other side of the forest, for you, 
what is Doug Spearman's forest right now? And then what are the trees? <laughs> you know, if you were to think about your mission and where you're feeling called, and you've said a little bit about that, but yeah, what's your forest and what are your trees? Well, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, like, yeah, in that, in that, in what I said, I did talk about the forest, the group of the forest, but the, 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 the forest was just the thing in the way of where I wanted to go. But when you, I tend to be tree guy as opposed to forest guy because I just, I tend to do what's right in front of me knowing that I have a goal. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So you have, sometimes you just have to make it tree to tree, you know, obstacle to obstacle, whatever that is, or, or discovery to discovery. How about that? Um, currently, what are my trees and what are my forests? I think, I think the big, the bigger forest is, is, um, well, let me just back up and say this. One of the reasons why I wanted to leave LA is having been brought up in, uh, in an integrated world and in an integrated family that's still sort of, you know, skewed black. Mm. And, um, and my life in LA didn't have sort of a day-to-day -day communal interaction with enough diversity. Mm. And so I moved here right before the pandemic started and also like four months before the, you know, George Floyd was killed and the social uh, justice movement started up. And, you know, a lot of what, you know, I'm very black right now, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I, you know, and I live in a city that is 65% black. So I'm getting experiences on a day to day basis in living in the deep South that you know i haven't had probably certainly not i haven't had as an adult let's put it that way and i'd say the trees are how to negotiate the individual relationships that i have on a day-to-day -day basis whether it's with somebody at the gas station a cashier at the, at the local market or the new friends that I'm, I'm making because all of this is happening in the hothouse environment of political and social justice change and a worldwide pandemic and and me being the age that I am trying to do the things that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. No, thank you for that. I'm curious about, so let's talk about age for a second. Um, at this point in your life, and you're still reflecting and moving forward, at the point that say you were a character on Noah's Ark, um, I would say culturally and probably still today, LGBT inclusion, advancing a sense of welcome, black men able to be fully in the embodiment that they were created to be but publicly on screen you know available was like nouveau riche what gave you either in that moment or in your history the kind of courage to say yes i will be that face i will be on that screen i will step into that gap that exists socially culturally all the ways <laughs> that you might define that Oh, oh, okay. Well, two things. One, nouveau riche means newly rich. Is is is, is how do you mean that? Oh, I, I mean, at that time, I think it was sort of a sexy, let's do it. We can put this out there. Like culturally, Black people have now arisen to a place that we might tell about their lives in a you know a publicly interesting way. At that moment, that's what I felt like Noah's Ark sort of entered in where it made sense to sit down and watch that show as a young black man, I guess. That's sure. it. So I'm well, I, 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 I think a lot of it has to do where you were raised and how you were raised. I mean, like, you know, I was in high school when the, <clears throat> yeah, I remember going to college and people telling me like the white kids at Indiana university, having not had an experience with a middle-class black person or an upper middle-class black person, not believing that the Cosby show was real. Mm. And I grew up, in, in, a, in a suburban family that was in the middle and upper middle class. Do you know what I mean? So a lot of the things that somebody would think of maybe as being courageous were just like, it was just like, well, that's what you do. Do you know what I mean? Like I, I wasn't scared to take the part. In fact, I remember when Patrick and I talked on the phone and, and uh, like Patrick called me to do the show. I wasn't originally cast in the show. I was a replacement. I'm a recast in that show. And um, 
he called me to ask me to do it and I couldn't because I was going on a trip but he called me and I he called me even while I was on the plane and when I got off the plane I was listening to the message and he explained who the character was in the message and the thing that made me say yes was that uh, the character I played Chance was a college professor he was married or he was in a long-term relationship he didn't get married until the end of the first season but they were raising a four-year-old daughter and I had never seen two black men raise a child, two black gay men raise a child ever, and certainly not on television. And I thought it was the most um, revolutionary thing I had ever seen. And I was like, yeah, I want to be part of this. Because it's really just about modeling behavior for somebody else. You know what I mean? So I just thought, like, wow, let's explore that. Let's see what this is like. And so I said, yes to that and that was the reason it wasn't you know and, and you know again for the most part it's just a job you know what i mean it's just like i'm just going i'm looking for my next job you don't know that that you don't realize when you take the job what's going to come with it i you know you know i, I you know i didn't sign up to be a role model i signed up to be an actor you know i want to hit my marks say my lines and then you go home at the end of the day i don't i didn't realize what was going to be attached to that um, but now you do know in some way um, of what it means to be a something that's transformative um, then and now. I mean, I think in, in some ways it's become, you, you have the probability of being a part of something that is iconic in that sense, because you're right. It was, I love the words you use, revolutionary. What's revolutionary for you now? Like if that was revolutionary for you in that moment of Doug Spearman's journey, what's well, what's the revolutionary? Well, now? I don't think there's anything revolutionary about. I mean, let me put it this way: from a personal standpoint, I became aware pretty probably in the early two thousands or right around the time of the show that my life was political. You know what I mean? Mm. It was always going to be political. As a black man living in America, I have a political life. As a black gay man, I definitely have a political life. You know what I mean? Like we we don't have the the, the luxury of hiding, and mm. or the luxury of ignorance. You know what I mean? There's this really great. There's this movie called Love Field with Dennis Haysbert and um, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer that came out in the '90s and. At one point, there's this amazing scene in the movie where Dennis turns on Michelle and said, you know, my daughter doesn't have the luxury of being stupid. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? She's a black girl growing up in like in 1960s Texas. And, you know, it's part of the talk that we get, like at least I got and a lot of people I know in my family got, is that you have a responsibility not only to your family, but to the race. And, you know, like you might be the first and only black person anybody ever meets. I mean, I doubt if that's as much true now as it was then but in terms of like what i see happening in the world that's political and, and like that blows my mind the fact that pose is on the air at all is mind-blowing to me you know what i mean there's a show about black trans women and their experience and the people in their lives right that's crazy to me you know given you know like i was bewitched was on when i was born you know what i mean it was a, it's a completely different world. And, and also, you know, I gotta say, I'm just, I'm just like little Nas X just blows my mind. Every time I see him, like his, like the, the things he chooses to do as an artist and as a person and how he shows up and how the world, how mainstream culture has just went, yeah, bring us more than that, you know, bring us more of that. And that's incredible to me. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if you saw Saturday Night Live, but like, aside from the wardrobe malfunction he had, that he was on stage shirtless in the tightest pair of pants, surrounded by black male dancers who were all over him in such a hypersexual way that would have been impossible 10 years ago. Yeah. You, know, you know, I don't know if you ever noticed Noah's Ark, but we never swear. We can't even say, we, there's no swearing in Noah's Ark. And we had to say things like, instead of like, 
we, we, you know, like you could even say sex club on Noah's Ark. You had to say a hookup bar. Mm. You know what I mean? Because it was on, because it was because of the tier of cable it was on, and they were so nervous about like, you know, upsetting anybody. I mean, they were so the producers were so nervous they wanted us not to be out. You know, we got a we got a public relations talk at the beginning of the series of, right before it came on the air about like not. They wanted us to create an air of mystery. And I'm like, if you Google me, you know I'm gay. You know, I've been gay for a long time and I'm involved in shit. And, um, excuse me. And, um, and I just thought, I, why would I, you know, like they were so nervous about rocking the boat and, and getting thrown off the air that we, you know, like I used to call it gay Disney. You know what I mean? It was it was just so. But we don't live in that world anymore. We've advanced so far that who we are in our truest, authentic selves is now able to be on the air. I also think it's a little, you know, like, do you realize Noah's Ark went off the air more than 10 years ago? And there has not been a replacement. No. At all. And so that should tell you something. That there's, well, I'm gonna ask you, what do you think they're saying? <laughs> well, well, I, st I, I still think it, it it means that they haven't completely invested in in black gay men. I mean, I read, you know, I, I you know, I've got an audition after we do this for a role that's not it's a gay role, but he wasn't actually written for a black man. But I almost never get no. Let's put it this way: no, I never get called to read anything. Um, that's for specifically a black gay man. Mm. Mm. That's that's a powerful. I felt that <laughs> because I I think you know um, the tension of in your world the character, and I think sometimes in my world the archetype, but even the faith narrative, it isn't written for a black gay man. <laughs> They're not anticipating that, right. Uh, yeah, no, I get stuff all the time, you know, and, and I can always tell, I'm like, this was written for a white guy because this, and and what they look for is a white guy's reaction, but they want the skin to be brown. And I'm like, a black, I, in fact, I was on a project not too long ago, and I'm like, you know, as a black father, I'm going to have a very different reaction than the one you want me to have. Mm -hmm. I will show you what it looks like when a black dad gets in this situation. As opposed to like just generic dad, just in the way like just in the way kids talk, you know, like you know, you know how you know you talk to a black adult when you're a kid or, or a child or even an adolescent. You know what I mean? Like there's just a different way of hearing. Mm -hmm. So I just have to bring all that I can to whatever part that I get. And you know that. In God Talks, I often think sometimes people are watching this uh, who were drawn, led, whatever term you want to use, um, and they have some questions about things that people bring up. And so you, what you just, the, the label I might use um, is there is a level of self-efficacy and even advocacy that you have the presence to say, hmm, actually, here's where I'm going to lean in, <laughs> even for this box, to tell you uh, it's not going to fit. Um, what do you think sort of motivates you, gives you the whatever it is, the word you would use, to be able to sort of claim space um, in those areas? Because I think people are trying to still discern that in this polarized world, how do I claim space? Well, first of all, it's an actor's job. That's what any actor would do, would just be like, hey, you hired me. I'm. Do you want any of me in this or not? You know what I mean? But all actors are required to do that kind of due diligence and speak mm. up. You know what I mean? It just it comes with our craft and it also comes with knowing who you are as a person and what you can do. You know what I mean? And, and I know me as an actor. I mean, I've been doing this since 19. I've been actually acting since I was seven. I've been training since I was 14 and I've been professionally doing it since 1990. So that's 31 years. You know what I mean? So I and you know, and I've studied with amazing teachers and I've worked a lot. So I, you know, I have a wealth of experience to draw and to go, hey, this is who I am and this is what I believe, and this is a this is the part of the collaboration. You know what I mean? 
but also it depends on like what the box is that they want. I mean, I have I have not gotten parts as a gay man because I'm not what they want as a gay man. You know what I mean? Because I like, I, in fact, I had to say something really like I've <laughs> I once had to you know to to tell a casting director that yes, I really am gay in real life. And do I need to physically prove it with somebody in front of you to get you to understand that gay comes in a, a, a variety? And so I'm always trying to stick up for the variety, you know, mm. because I very rarely see, you know, gay men who aren't sort of in these polarized boxes with very little three dimensionality. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I felt that too, <laughs> in, in more ways than one. Um, I'm one of the you know intents of God talks was also to connect people with your own sense of spirituality, um, and so I'm wondering if you could speak to a little bit about your own grounding, like what grounds you. Um, in your daily walk in this world, you know, um, in any way you might describe that. Well, meditation first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'm in a, I'm 20 years into a 12 step program. That happens to be, if, if you know anything about 12 step programs or spiritual based programs. So, you know, luckily when I was growing up, my mother uh, made it very clear that she and my dad could not uh, assign me a relationship with God. That it was that was my job to figure that out and find it. And so she, when I was twelve, said, "You're going to start seeking whatever that is, and you're going to start Sunday. So pick some place to go and then go there." And so that led me to churches and cathedrals and synagogues and ashrams and holy places and tripping on acid in the desert and. You know, like reading, so much reading. And um, and I just sort of take the best of everything that I've gotten because they're all universal truths. But as part of this, the 12-step the program I'm in, um, prayer and meditation are a daily practice. They're part of your daily reprieve. And so I, especially in the last six years, I've really leaned into meditation. So I meditate at least... 20 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. um, gratitude is the number one thing. Like I pretty, I like I do a gratitude list in the morning, and I have a little chat with God right before I go to sleep about you know what I got accomplished today, what I didn't get accomplished today, and thank you for that. I mean, I, I try to keep that conversation and the, the the awareness of the presence of whatever God is, whatever you want to call it, like higher power or source energy or, or you know inner being you know like i try to keep a conscious like some part of my consciousness attached to that all day long as much as i possibly can you know i haven't been to church except to go to you know a wedding or a funeral um in 30 years like I haven't belonged to a church in 30 years because I realized, um, I, and let me just say this, I, you know, in my twenties and thirties, I really saw it hard and I belonged to some amazing churches and, and heard some amazing people who blew my mind and blew open the strictures of, you know, the walls of organized religion for me, even though I was sitting in a church. Um, but I realized that God was older than every religion. So uh, my relationship with God wasn't predicated on a on as one minister put uh, this father Tom was a minister of the church, Christ Church Longwood that I belong to in Boston. He said God's not in a books a, a, in a book, a box, or a basement. Mm. In, so with me, it's meditation. It's just you know it's prayer it's gratitude it's it's looking for that connection and clarity on a daily basis listening for it seeing it and like i believe that my higher power my god speaks very fluent dark 
Do you know what I mean? Have you ever heard the expression, God speaks French to Frenchmen? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So like God, God will get to you in a way that, that, that is the clearest for you. So with me, it's songs on the radio, or it's bumper stickers or billboards, movie titles, things like that. God knows how to get my attention. Mm, I love that. I love that God <laughs> speaks Doug. I hope see he speaks Earth. They yeah. speak Narelle too. You know, of course they that, do. Um, no, I, I believe that fundamentally. I think about so when you hear a concept like meditation, when you hear a concept like even what we're describing for some people, the concept that God is not in this particular box or the stereotypical cartoon image of somewhere sitting on the cloud with a long beard and often white. Um, how how would you say, uh, of a person who's curious about how do I even find meditate? Like, how do I even start or what would I look at? Were there certain things that were kind of an invitation to you as you thought, okay, I'm going to try this out. I'm going to explore this. Um, maybe share a little bit about that for somebody who might, after watching this, go, let me Google meditation. <laughs> let me go to YouTube. Go to YouTube because, okay, so... My, my history with meditation goes back a long way when my mother started meditating in the, the, in the 70s. And I would come home and she'd be meditating after school. And I'd be like, oh, this is weird. Nobody else's mother's meditating in the den. You know, when they get home, why do you have to be doing it? But she explained it to me. And meditation isn't just about being quiet, counting your breaths or doing that. It means... It also means to think deeply on a particular subject. You know what I mean? It's almost impossible to get the human brain to shut off. You can't stop your thoughts. But what you can do is just not hold on to them as they're going through your head, which I think a lot of people get uh, screwed up with when they think of meditation, that they have to be in a certain position, breathing a certain way with a certain sound or not sound. But I've done a lot of, I mean, there are tons, there, there's tons of literature there are tons of articles online about meditating. I um, I went through a breakup about six years ago, and I knew it was going to hurt. I knew it was really going to hurt, and I knew I was going to I was going to be in for it. And I said, I I want something to not not take the pain away, but help me deal with what was going to come up. So I just went to YouTube and I started listening to guided meditation. And then I, that led me to different books that led me to more guided meditations to just apps where, you know, like I use one called Insight Timer, um, mm -hmm. where I can, you know, set a time limit for myself. And I started with five minutes and then I worked myself to 15 and then I got to 20. And sometimes I'll do 40. And um, there are all kinds of ways to get into meditation. And I think the best way is to let somebody guide you. And that means go through guided meditations. And there are a million of them. There's some really great ones. I mean, uh, um, Wayne Dyer, Dr. Wayne Dyer, who died in 2016, his, his tapes and his, his, uh, his uh, meditations on YouTube are fantastic. That was, the, that was my way in. You know what I mean? So I think there's all kinds of way in. But don't, you could do what's called a walking meditation. You know, you could do a, like I sometimes I don't do anything because I read a, a, I was reading about Buddhist monks who just meditated and, and they were very aware of their environment while they were meditating. So they don't it's not about music and gongs. It's just you're like, oh, there's a bird or there's somebody cutting grass. Or there's it's just about being present with yourself. You're not trying to go anywhere. It's not, for me, it's not about transcendental meditation. Where I'm literally trying to lift out of my body. It's just about being present in the moment. That's all meditation is, because this is where God is in the moment, not in the past, not in the future, but right here, right now. Um, I have um, sort of a, almost a final question, but I should tell you that as a preacher, I always have another one. <laughs> so it's going to come, but I'm going to act like this is maybe my final question. A few years ago, God, probably 10 years ago, but maybe less, um, Essence Magazine, the editor of Essence Magazine, wrote um, a whole editorial on prayer. And I've used it many times as a pastor because it was powerful in the sense that it sort of helped people unlock their box of prayer. You know, it was not just sit on your knees and do these things. It was about walking. It was about discernment. It was about meditation. 
Um, and you said two of the practices that you offer are prayer and meditation. And so what is prayer to Doug? When you think about the act of praying, what is that for Doug? Well, I mean, that's, you know, that's that's a very bespoke in the moment, what do I need right now <laughs> kind mm. of thing. Because when I, I belong to a church, I belong to the Unity Church in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill. And we used to sing a song called Our Thoughts Are Prayers. Our mm. Thoughts Are Prayers. And then the, the minister, God rest her soul, her name was Amalia, talked about the fact that every thought you have is a prayer. Every thought. So you have to be mindful of what you're thinking. You know what I mean? And that, to me, is... You know, sometimes it's a conversation I get into with God. I mean, I don't necessarily pray on my knees anymore. I pray standing up. I pray walking. I pray. I just talk out loud to God because God doesn't need me in a particular. I don't need to be in a particular position or in a particular place in order to connect to my God anymore. I, you know, I was raised to pray on my knees and I did probably until about five years ago. Every once in a while, I'll do it because if, because I, I'll do it because it helps centers me and calms me down and gets me in the place where I can have that conversation. But I can have a conversation sitting here at my desk because God doesn't care where I am or what I'm wearing or what I'm doing. You know what I mean? Doesn't care. Doesn't really mind. God doesn't even care if I swear. You know what I mean? Sometimes I'm like, you don't need their own God to swear. <laughs> Uh, so I, as I predicted, there is another question that has arisen uh, that I'm curious. Um, and I just want to go back to that moment. I think you said maybe 12, uh, where your parents sort of say, you're going to go find something. So go out and we're not going to put it for you. Um, I'm curious if there's been, been any sort of reflective conversations with your parents over the years about that and how that's given you the liberty in some ways to have your own. Like, I love a phrase you just used two sentences ago, my God. And I'm often encouraged to help people find their God, their divinity, um, and not necessarily feel that there's a particular box. So anyway, have you had any sort of kind of, hey, you had this, you invited me to do this, and it's opened up this for me? Um, no, we never had a conversation about it. Both my parents are dead now. But my mom came to church with me a couple times and she did go, she went to a 12 step meeting with me. Um, but she came to the church I belong to in Washington one, a, a couple times. And I think they looked for that direction in my life, in my everyday life. So I was, you know, it was, it was attraction rather than promotion. I wasn't talking about it. We didn't have to talk about it, I was living it. You know what mm. I mean? They saw it, so they didn't have any problem. You know, they weren't like, what the hell are you doing? But they knew that I was doing something, you know what I mean? And it was very evident because it, 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 it informed my relationship with them. It informed my relationships. I mean, like, I remember, what was it? Was, no, the second boyfriend I ever brought home, my mom, I brought him, to, I brought my mother to church to meet him. And Mark was singing, Mark had a solo in the choir. And, um, and then he came and stood by, but, you know, between my mother, uh, on the other side of my mother and I. So my mother met my boyfriend in church. So she was like, yeah, come on over for just Sunday dinner. It's fine. Do you know what I mean? So it was like, you know, that had that informed. Um, I'll tell you the story that, re you know, it's funny that you would ask me that that thing, that that, that revelatory moment actually happened with Daryl Stevens in a hotel room in, Van you know, in the Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, and we, we were shooting, um, and this was a very profound moment for me. And I don't even know if Daryl... Daryl and I've never talked about this, and I don't even, you know, it, it's never come up between us. But I was, um, uh, Nova Scotia is very Christian. And so Easter weekend, everything closed on Friday. And everything stayed closed until Tuesday. Everything. And um, Daryl and I got up Easter Sunday and were trying to figure out what we wanted to do that day in Nova Scotia. And Daryl said something that um, he said, expletive Easter, as a bit, you know, like he was, it was like, he was just disappointed that everything was closed. He wasn't, you know, cursing out Easter. He's like, 
effing Easter. And I had never heard anybody swear with a religious holiday attached to it. You know what I mean? And that set me on this, this like nine month journey into realizing that I didn't have to, that the label of, that any label I put on myself, Buddhist, Taoist, Christian, Catholic, was going to be so small in the realm of what God actually is that I no longer needed those any of those labels ever again. And what's really funny, and then I read a book on that particular journey over that in that course of time. I read a book called A New Earth, and it's by a philosopher named Eckhart Tolle. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, a new Earth and the pre and the, and the his first book, The Power of Now, literally changed my spirituality and my relationship with myself, the world, and 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 my attachment to my inner being, my God. You know what I mean? And I, you know, so I take the words of you know the philosopher Jesus or Buddha or the Bodhisattva, you know, like anybody, in, you know, just you look for the truth. Because the truth is eternal and universal. Mm. The other things I can do with that. Like, you know, like I'm going to eat shellfish. I'm probably going to wear a poly cotton blend. I like playing football. You know what I mean? I'm not going to sell any woman into slavery. Um, so like, I don't, you know, like I'm not going to live my life by a set of rules that were written for a tribe of people who lived in the desert 4,000 years ago without refrigeration. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. And also, because I have discovered, you know, because I realized in church one day, I was looking at a cross. I was looking at a life-size crucifix, and I started to think, you know, like, I have white ancestors and, and relatives. I know that. But I did not know the gods of, like, my Irish ancestors before Christianity or my African ancestors of any of the tribes that they came from. Like, what god did they worship? How did they get in touch with that? You know what I mean? Like, because, because I think it's endemic in all humans to try to find their relationship to the divine and the connection to it. So I began this journey. Like, I'm like, I, I, you know, like, I, you know, like, I won't wear a crucifix because I mean, like, what, what does that suffering have to do with how I'm living my life right now? And besides, it's in the wrong shape. I really appreciate that because I think we continue to invite people um, through our stories to find the location within theirs. Um, and what I appreciated is that this wasn't an invitation about, well, here's Doug's box, you can jump in. But it was sort of a, do you need a box? <laughs> Which no, I, mean, look, is, it, is exactly a good like, I don't need a box. I don't need a box and I don't, I don't, I don't need the dogma that just sort of wants to control what I do. I mean, like I have a moral compass that constantly needs to be tuned. And that's what my daily relationship is with God. I mean, like, I, like trust me, I don't levitate. You know, I am not a saint. I mess up all the time. I do stuff that I that I have to clean up. You know what I mean? I'm just I am a, a human being having I'm a being having a human experience. Yeah. And so and some of that's really messy. So thank you so much um, just for one giving up your time the getting uh, me getting selfishly getting the opportunity to know you Doug the person a little better but also for the folks who will be able to watch this um, tonight I'm hoping that they also might have the probability of getting to know you a little bit more but also just as a lens um, I like I was just saying I really believe in the power of narrative um, and when we're sometimes able to hear someone else's story, maybe there's language in there or insight or even a doorway to discover our own voice and our own story. So I really appreciate that. Um, for folks who are not talks, one of the things you know is that I always ask um, our interview, uh, we, for the week, if they might talk to us about um, a charity or an organization that connected to 
um, and Doug has so thoughtfully uh, shared with me a little bit about Outfest.org. And so, Doug, would you mind sharing a little bit more about Outfest.org? And I want to invite everyone watching Doug Talks tonight to make a donation. Join Doug and I in, a, in donating to Outfest.org. Yeah, even a dollar helps, trust me. Um, so Outfest is um, on its on probably the most public facing side, the LGBTQ plus film festival in Los Angeles, California. But it's so much more than that. It's an outreach program and one of, they have a, a program called Outfest Forward. And that puts cameras in the hands of, of low income, at risk and uh, homeless LGBTQ plus uh, teenagers and young adults in LA and gives them skills, gives, gives them mentors and gives them the power to create their own cultural languages and have it reflected in us on, you know, on the biggest screen that we have, which is a film screen. So it gets them a chance to, to build skills, to tell their stories and actual build skills that they could actually go into the film marketplace with as creators and as crew people. But also the thing that I love most about Outfest is this program that we have called Fusion that happens every spring. And Fusion is one of the only, if not only, LGBTQ plus people of color film festivals highlighting the works internationally of brown, black, yellow, red people all over America and all over the world. And that happens every March. And that's super important. Because sometimes at a lot of festivals, what you see is a very, you know, a lot of this, a lot of um, the same kind of faces and spaces and stories that you would see on every, any other place. But Fusion makes sure and Outfest programmers make sure to highlight the voices of South Americans and Central Americans and indigenous, indigenous Americans and Black Americans and Asian, everybody. Mm. So again, friends, we want you to join Doug and I in donating to Outfest.org. Doug, I always end God Talks with offering a reflective blessing um, to the person that I've been talking to. Um, and I try to listen throughout my time with them and even before we meet uh, for what the universe might be offering me uh, to say to you or to offer to you. And one of the things I kept saying, and I was wondering, that's so interesting, why does this word keep coming up? Um, but it is about the power of story. And so my blessing for you, my friend, is that the power of your story, the life that you currently live, the embodiment of you, the personhood that is the experiment, may your story, may the narrative of your being continue to be revolutionary and continue to invite other people to see themselves more fully and authentically. And the more you find you, may it be an invitation for everyone around you to just have a little bit greater of an invitation to find them. Thank you, my brother, for this time and this intention. Um, it's been great. So hold on for me one second, Doug. God Talks friends, I hope tonight you have enjoyed uh, this intimate experience with Doug Spearman and learned just a little bit more about who he is. Again, I know that you will join me in donating to outfest.org and I look forward to seeing you on God Talks soon. Have a